The topic of this video is properties of steel. Um, in a previous lecture, we talked about some fairly fundamental properties of materials in general. Um, and we spoke pretty extensively about the whole idea of iron crystals and the role of carbon. So the primary topic uh, that we're going to get into now is what are the typical yield stresses? What's the stiffness? And more specifically, what are the cross-sectional properties that are commonly available in steel sections? Most uh, steel construction consists of wide flanges. Uh, this shows a fairly old picture of a glowing hot uh, wide flange or, or what we used to call an eye section <coughs> being rolled. Um, <coughs> this uh, billet of material is pulled through a series of rollers. And by the way, in this space, the major source of light is the glowing metal, so it's a fairly dark space in terms of its normal illumination level. Um, so, in this process, there will be two rollers, which are going, this one is rotating that way, that one is rotating that way, and a billet is being pulled through the rollers and shaped while it's being pulled. Now, this is a pretty high stress operation. It's typically done with uh, the um, steel at an elevated temperature, although we do something called cold rolling, which is at a, a much lower temperature and produces a very high quality of steel, but puts particular stresses on the equipment. Um, the equipment, therefore, has to be super high strength, and of course it wears out a lot faster. So, here we've gone from this billet to this enlarged view, <coughs> and the rollers have been replaced by their effect on the billet. And you'll notice that there are squeezing forces or um, perpendicular components which we might call radial to the rollers. So that would be these forces or these stresses right here. In addition, there is a tangential or frictional force which the rollers are using to pull the billet uh, through the roller system. Um, clearly, there are conflicts here in that if you look at these two forces, for example, this one right here is the tangential component this one right here is the radial or perpendicular component, which is right there. This is producing a resultant force in that direction. And when you think about it, that resultant force is trying to exclude the billet from being drawn through. In other words, this is more like a rejecting force than a pulling force. On the other hand, if we look at these two components, the tangential component is right there. The perpendicular component is represented right here, and the resultant is in this direction. So the net effect is that there is a, a traction or pulling force pulling the billet through. Now, these two things are conflicting with each other, and clearly the more bite we try to get, in other words, the more we try to reduce this down to something smaller, uh, the greater these forces are going to be, and basically we will not be able to pull the billet through. So we have two, two limitations here on how much we can do in any given step. The first is if we try to reduce the billet too much, we won't have enough friction to even pull it through against these rejecting forces. The second thing is that Steel is a lot, uh, at some point, like hamburger meat, if any of you have ever made a hamburger patty, if you just squash it right down, uh, the material fractures. In other words, it splits out near the boundary. Well, this kind of sudden change in the geometry of the metal can also produce those kinds of fractures. So we have two major motives that are saying to us, let's not try to accomplish too much in one rolling step. In other words, we're going to take a lot of steps in order to achieve whatever final beam shape we want. And the way we typically do this 
is with what we call a three high roller set. Um, we could have a pair of rollers and we just keep running it through and running it through. <coughs> but what's proven to be convenient and to reduce the size of the shop that's required is to have this three high roller set and within this roller set there are lots of different phases or stages of the rolling process. So the billet moves through here. It is handled by a drop table where it's lowered down. Then it runs back through again. Then there's a drop table here that lifts it up and runs it through again. So this process might involve uh, 10 or 12 stages and it might look something like this. So here we've got a top roller, a middle roller, and a bottom roller. And on the first pass, which is shown right here, we might go from... <coughs> we would go from a simple rectangle to this extremely crude shape, which is hardly a wide flange at all. Uh, it would go through here. It would get lifted up and run back through here. Then it would get lifted lowered and run through there, lift it up and run back through here, and so forth <coughs> until we got through this fifth stage, at which point it's starting to look like a wide flange, but it's still pretty thick. These might be an example of what we call a jumbo section with very thick flanges and webs, which we might use as a column near the base of a building. Um, then we have a set, a new set of intermediate rollers there's a top, middle, and bottom. And this would be the sixth rolling process. So it goes through, it gets dropped down, it comes back, and is rolled again. Um, and we go through this sequence, and eventually we get something that's what we call the final pass for this particular shape we're trying to get at. <coughs> now, the nature of this process makes it clear we have a bunch of different sections along the way. We might say, well, that's the perfect section, or that's the perfect one, or here's the perfect one. So these will all be examples of some nominal um, cross-section. You know, it might be a W14, but clearly the geometry of that may not be exactly 14 inches. This may be where it finally ends up at 14 inches. Um, but they're all part of the same series. So to give you an idea of how that might look, um, here we have at the bottom here, W14 by 808. Now, this is, I chose this because this is the most absurd example. It's also one of the reasons that as an architect you'll need <coughs> some kind of a steel manual so that you can get dimensional information. But a W14 by 808 would be what we call a real jumbo column section. By the way, there are a huge number of W14s rolled. And the reason is that for most construction, we'll have on the order of a 15-foot floor-to-floor dimension. If the building is properly braced, that means the columns will be braced every 15 feet. And pretty much if you're bracing every 15 feet and you have a nominal 14 inch section, you've gone to the point where much larger sections are really not worth it from a buckling point of view. So you wouldn't need to go to a W16, for example. Uh, you just keep rolling fatter and fatter W14s. So here we have a W14 by 808. That means it's nominal 14 inches and it weighs 808 pounds per foot. Now what's interesting is if you go look at the depth in inches, it's actually not 14 inches deep. It's 22.8. And part of the reason that it <coughs> it's so deep <coughs> is that the flanges are extremely thick. Excuse me, here's the web. Let me find the flange thickness. It's right here. Uh, its flange thickness is over five inches. So this is about what we'd expect. It was supposed to be a W14, but by the time we put two extendedly, extended and extremely thick flanges, <coughs> 
Uh, the overall depth is actually closer to 22.8 or close to 23 inches in depth. So in other words, you have all kinds of things that are called W14s, but when you look at the depth and breadth and so forth, it's really not a W14 in any sense that you would normally understand it. This is a manifestation of our rolling process, which says you start with a big old fat billet and you keep rolling it thinner and smaller uh, until you come to some stopping point. You'll notice right above the 14s, as I mentioned, that's about as, as big as you need for a column. Um, suddenly there are far fewer members in the 16 category because it's assumed that the 16s are purely for beams and they're probably a lot more lightly loaded. Uh, so right here we might be talking about a column at the bottom of a 100-story building. Here we'd be talking just about a series of beams that are supporting various floors or portions of floors. <clears throat> so that kind of gives you uh, an understanding of W shapes and uh, certainly the importance of your knowing how big that member is so that you will understand how to draw it in your details and also understand how much of your floor area that it's actually taking up. Now wide flanges and angles and uh, shapes of that sort, channels, are what we call open sections. They tend to be made by a series of uh, rolling and squashing operations. Um, there are several of those operations that are needed, but they're all very similar and they're all handled while the metal is warm. And so um, there, it's a pretty inexpensive version of steel. Um, I'd like to talk about the contrast to that, which are what we call uh, closed sections or hollow sections. And here's how they are typically made. <clears throat> These are coils of steel plate. So they've already been taken from a billet to extremely long pieces of flat sheet. And then in this case, the sheet's been cut to a certain width. And then the whole thing has been put onto what we call a coil. In other words, that plate metal has been wrapped around and around and around and then banded with a steel band to keep it from snapping open. And that's the starting point for the additional operations that are necessary to turn this into uh, a closed section. And it's pretty important that this material get delivered at the right width because otherwise when it gets rolled into closure, it won't produce the right diameter of a closed section. These particular photographs were taken at the Copper Weld facility in Chicago, Illinois, and we're going to go through a series of steps. So, and by the way, before I forget, I want to tell you that some of this steel is 5 eighths of an inch thick, uh, and that's kind of a limiting factor in terms of fabrication. We don't typically produce hollow sections that are any thicker than that, so hollow sections tend to not be used in situations where there are extremely high loads. And for a variety of issues that we'll learn later on, there's no really good reason why we would want a round section uh, in those situations anyway. It would be pretty rare. So now one of these spools gets, uh, or coils, gets uncoiled and it gets dragged through this piece of equipment here and you'll notice it gets twisted and then it goes in this kind of helical format and then gets run out into the fabrication facility. Now there's a certain machine here that's supplying a certain bit of machinery somewhere off to the left here that's going to be doing the fabricating and <coughs> those things don't run at exactly the same rate. So the whole point of creating this helical geometry here is to give some dimensional tolerance so that when those two things don't go at exactly the same rate, we don't destroy the equipment. Um, it's pretty impressive though to think about a 5 8 inch thick uh, piece of material that gets manipulated in this way uh, 
where it's bending and going over the top and running through this helical configuration and so forth. Now, that goes through a series of rollers. And you'll notice there's a concave roller below, a convex roller above in this case. And at the moment I took this photograph, the, the assembly line was stopped, so you wouldn't normally see all this green fluid. This is actually a, a water with uh, some oil added to it as a lubricant. Um, it's mainly water as a coolant though and the oil as a lubricant uh, does help reduce the amount of friction. Right now all of that uh, lubricant is pooled here in this trough that's been taken, ch created. So right now this ribbon of steel has been partially rolled and the machinery has been stopped. I want you to notice the size of axles though that are necessary to make this work and also the material out of which these wheels are made or these rollers is unbelievably tough material. <clears throat> so this shows some examples of those shapes. Um, this is the next roller set down the line. You'll notice the curvature has gotten a little tighter and the dish on the bottom is a little tighter. Um, so it's a progression of curling this material around. Now at some point we go through rollers that are pretty narrow and you'll notice we're starting to introduce rollers on the side and those rollers on the side are beginning to curl the metal over and if we don't introduce that we can never bring it to closure so we got the curved roller on the bottom I'm sorry I didn't mean to do that <laughs> he did not get carried away there uh, good grief Okay, <clears throat> so there's a curved roller on the bottom, uh, which is concave, the convex roller on the top, and now we're starting to have some concave rollers coming in from the side, and you'll notice some more right here. Um, this is a view after that tubing has been rolled through enough stages that we see it as uh, a round cylinder. <clears throat> So, let me just see where I am in this. That round cylinder, once it's been brought to closure, gets run through this welder, which welds it together. This is called an induction welder. The particular one you're looking at here is uh, 600 kilowatts. So in other words, it's about 0.6 megawatts of welding power. <clears throat> Now the reason you need so much welding power is because this tubing comes through at about 10 feet per second, which is a pretty good jog for a normal human being. Um, in fact, I would argue that's right on the verge of a run. So this material is flying through here and it's getting welded with this induction welder. So there are a lot of things that have to be balanced in this process. Um, the, the entire piece of tubing has to be moving at the right rate that it doesn't either get under welded or burned up in the welder. And so while they're getting all the equipment adjusted, um, my sense in the factory was there was a lot of tension um, because there are so many variables that can go wrong <clears throat> and they're trying to get everything into balance so that they can run out many thousands of feet of this before they have to stop rolling it and set up to, s to roll some other size section. Um, this shows the tubing after it's been run out and you'll notice the incredibly long space here and that's because when this material is moving that fast and something goes wrong uh, it's, it's not easy to shut this process down and um, stop all that momentum basically. So this factory has to be very long in order to accommodate those uh, issues. <clears throat> now I wish I'd gotten a picture of this with me standing next to them because every one of these is a saw that's six feet in diameter and about three-eighths of an inch thick 
Um, so all of these are sitting up off the floor substantially. So my head would have come to about right here. And the way this process works is there are two of these uh, wheel, two of these saws, which track down the line. They have to be able to solve chunks of this material and flip it out of the production path um, <clears throat> while it's still running. Nobody can stop this process because everything will get out of adjustment. So this, these two six foot diameter circular saws are moving down the production line at whatever the speed the, the tubing is coming out. And, one, and they both uh, simultaneously uh, dive into this tube and start cutting it. And um, right at the moment that the two saws are about to collide with each other, one of them pulls back and lets the other one finish it off. So the reason for the two saws is that, as I understand it, they need that kind of sawing capacity to assure that they will complete a saw cut and then allow the two uh, huge saw blades to retract back and cut another piece. Um, so this is one of the reasons, by the way, that you never get steel tube to precise lengths. Uh, usually it's like within a range of three inches because it's hard to move a six foot saw blade precisely enough to get a really good precise cut. So you're given extra material and then uh, it's your obligation to cut it off to whatever length you need it to be. Okay, so ironically, it's easier to do round pipe or round tube than square tube. So in fact, the way we typically do this is we take a round tube and we run it through a series of rollers, which I call mashers. And they're basically taking a round tube and turning it into a square tube. So here you see something still got a lot of wall curvature, but you're beginning to see the corners forming. And then this is the next step after that, where it's now been rolled into something that's identifiable as a square tube. Now I wanna comment that these welds, and by the way, another comment I make is these welds are cleaned up while the thing is flying through the system. So there's a cutting knife that cuts the excess weld material off and that material becomes very dangerous because it's being generated at 10 feet per second and if there's a break in it that material starts flying all around the shop so there are a lot of uh, pretty high stress issues associated with producing something like this uh, one of the things they do is they periodically cut this tubing and they take a piece of it and they jam it down over a conical ripping device and they put enough pressure on it that they eventually tear the tube and if they tear the tube at the weld then they have to discard uh, that tubing because it means that the weld doesn't measure up to standards uh, so it's pretty remarkable what they do they also um, uh, hammer in emboss in data on the insides of these coils um, I believe they said every 19 inches to describe uh, what company that metal came from and what batch it was in. So there's a pretty amazing uh, data trail that will allow people to do troubleshooting in the event that there are any problems uh, on structural failures. <clears throat> so here is a set of tables that the steel manual provides. The steel manual coming from the American Institute of Steel Construction who provided this data for us. Um, this shows the shape. It's called round HSS, which means round hollow steel section. This is a new nomenclature. We used to call it tube and we still sometimes do. You'll notice I kind of carelessly called it that. Um, and in the old designations it carried a T with it, but now it's round HSS. And you'll notice the dimensions um, are designated, or the designation is an HSS 3.5. The fact that there's only one number here <coughs> um, 
means that um, it has to be round because if it was square they'd have to give you two dimensions and if it was rectangular they'd have to give you two dimensions. This is also sometimes designated an HSS 3.5 meaning it's uh, 3.5 inches on the outside dimension. So let's go find well this is the diameter so they don't list the diameter anywhere in here but they do give the wall thickness and so sometimes we add the wall thickness as a second dimension to this but it's really clear from the numbers what's the overall dimension and what's the wall thickness so three and a half inch tubing with a, about a 0.3 uh, inch wall thickness weighs about 10.7 uh, pounds per foot All right, we also have another type of material. And before I go on to that, let me go back and say this tube is always designated by its outside diameter. And the outside diameter is given in nice clean numbers. Like for example, uh, two and seven eighths inches or three inches or 3.5 inches. We're gonna contrast to that to something called pipe. Steel pipe was originally developed for plumbing purposes and its so-called nominal dimension is um, mostly indicative of the inside dimension. So you'll notice here's the actual inside dimension and it matches pretty well with the nominal dimension except sometimes it's a little high, uh, sometimes it's even higher sometimes it's a little less like the 7.98 is a little less than eight um, steel pipe was developed for plumbing purposes and so they're mainly worried about the inside dimension which is shown right here because they made so much plumbing pipe and because it was so inexpensive the structural community adopted it so there are a lot of people who are still specifying steel pipe even though they have dimensionally things that probably make more sense in the structural or certainly in the in the fabricational domain so in fact the so-called HSS round or round tube was developed more for um, product designers people who work for example in the automotive industry where knowing the actual outside dimensions was a crucial part of design it was less crucial in structures so structural people tended to adopt this these screwy dimensions uh, even though they're not great to deal with from a design point of view <clears throat> uh, one great thing about pipe is it doesn't give you a whole lot of options which means life doesn't get really complicated okay so here we have <laughs> um, a nominal eight inch pipe which is actually about eight and five eighths inch on the outside diameter and here are all the wall thicknesses and by the way this is this table right here is something called schedule 40 where the wall thickness goes in an appropriate uh, ratio to the inside diameter in other words if you double the inside diameter you roughly double the wall thickness uh, and the purpose of that is the containment of the fluid pressure inside for structural reasons uh, and sometimes sometimes plumbing reasons we do something called an extra strong and then this is where everything gets weird because we originally said all the plumbing dimensions were based on the inside being representative essentially of what's nominal now suddenly we keep a constant outside so you notice 12.8 12.8 10.8 10.8 and we're varying the inside by varying the wall thickness so you can get something called an extra strong pipe which simply has the same outside dim dimension but a thicker wall and I have used this on a few of my projects where it turns out in almost every case some tube like this 10 inch tube or excuse me pipe uh, 
um, will work fine everywhere in the building except in some special situation where I need this extra wall thickness and if for architectural reasons we don't want a different column size there uh, this is a way of getting around that problem. Okay one other topic related to steel properties or basic steel properties. We can do something kind of like rolling except we call it drawing and it's this is a nib that's made out of extremely high strength material this would be a piece of steel rod that uh, is pulled through the nib and in the process the rod gets smaller and it does by in infinitesimal amounts because you just if there's too much friction in here you will break this portion of the rod that's pulling it through but this drawing process reduces the size of the rod and eventually if you do enough drawing processes it turns into what we call wire um, meaning it has a pretty small diameter um, the material is actually smearing uh, and being work hardened so in other words planes of iron atoms are flowing by each other and then they get snagged on carbon atoms and then some other planes move and eventually um, so many dislocations are jammed full of carbon atoms that you end up with a really hard strong brittle material that won't tolerate any more drawing because it will snap. Um, the end product of this is what we used to call piano wire then we called it aircraft cable and now we just call it high strength wire because basically it has become much more common in its applications and it's not specific to any application like pianos or aircraft. Um, this is a kind of an old picture and I apologize for it but um, there's a series of rollers here and the wire is going back and forth and being drawn through dies as it is <clears throat> as it's proceeding. This stuff right here is just a sort of uh, liquid uh, which is poured over this whole process to cool it down but basically we have a continuous piece of wire going through here getting smaller and smaller at each point and every one of these stages there's friction on it that's pulling it in this process so we can start with a, a rod that might be a half inch in diameter and by the time we get done we might reduce it to uh, an eighth of an inch or less um, and it starts off as fairly mild steel that can tolerate uh, maybe 36 or 56 kips per square inch of stress before it yields and it ends up as 250 uh, kips per square inch by the time it's done. So I'm going to give you some quick numbers by the way. Um, let's go back up here and we'll talk about wide flanges. Uh, I think I mentioned before that they used to come a lot in 36 KSI. Um, 36 is largely being phased out except for the jumbo sections and most of them uh, have a yield stress of 50 kips per square inch and that's a number I would like for you to remember. Uh, you can get it up to 65 but our most common uh, wide flanges and angles and channels are 50 kips per square inch uh, for the yield stress. Now when we come down and we talk about round HSS it's 42 kips per square inch is the yield stress. If we subsequently take the round section and mash it into a square section <coughs> we actually work harden it some and the yield stress goes up to 46 kips per square inch. And finally in steel pipe that's our lowest grade material it's 35 kips per square inch is the yield stress that you should assume. So I'll repeat that wide flanges typically 50 KSI HSS round 46 KS excuse me 42 KSI HSS square 46 KSI uh, 
and finally steel pipe is 35 ksi that concludes our discussion of steel properties uh, we will proceed next to concrete